Well, welcome to this session. There was supposed to be uh, another session originally. I don't know uh, who came for that session. But uh, this is a replacement, so I hope you like it. And I'm going to talk about uh, microservices a little bit and why they shouldn't share data. And apparently the period says I'm pretty confident about it. Anyway, my name is uh, Dennis van der Stelt. Uh, this is what I look like. I uh, work for a particular software and we build and service bus. But I don't, don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about microservices and see how Docker and Kubernetes can help and containers. Because if you look at the ship, uh, this, uh, if you really have OCD, then you probably wouldn't approve. I don't mind too much about the colors. Everything else is really balanced out. So uh, who doesn't love containers and Docker and I don't know what else. But even those choices don't always make up for a good architecture. So the question is, why are we always looking for something else, for the latest technologies and I don't know what else? Why are we looking for this better architecture? I think one of the main reasons is because all our systems that we build and whatever we choose, we end up with something like this. At the top, it might look initially, it might look very beautiful, very well designed, but at some point maintenance cost kicks in and it takes way too long for us to add new features or change something, etc. And the question is if Docker and uh, Azure Functions, serverless, AWS, Lambdas, etc., help build our microservices better. But before I want to get into that, first I want to do a little bit of history lesson. I don't know if anyone knows what kind of computer this is. I hear people clapping even. Well, I didn't like this computer too much. This was a Commodore 64. I was more of the opposition, and this was my favorite computer of choice back in the days. Did anyone have an MSX? Nobody? Oh, you're missing out. You're missing out. Anyway, this was my first computer. And uh, the first time I started it up, I was playing this game. Konami Tennis. And I had so much fun playing it. And whenever I got a high ball, and I was holding the joystick in my hands, which was cordless, obviously, I would like run back and pull the computer off the table. But whatever. Anyway, Konami Tennis came in this cartridge that I had to put in under the bl black, um, whatever the thing uh, is called. I had to open up the computer, put it in, and then I could play the game. But once I booted up the computer without a cartridge in it, and suddenly I was presented with this. And there was a nice book with it, so I started programming, Hello World, obviously, and this was what I ended up with, and I was sold. So I was starting in MSX Basic back in the time, and that was around the year that these movies were released. Does anyone know what year it is? 85, for, exactly. This was 85, and this is what I uh, looked like back in the day. What I didn't know was that I was doing procedural programming. That was introduced around the 60s, so even a bit before I was born. But uh, I was doing BASIC, but Fortran and COBOL were kind of like the same. And everything was rainbows and unicorns. And I literally wrote the best code ever, or at least I thought. The more lines of code, however, I was uh, writing, the more I ended up with this. And I didn't even know it was called spaghetti code back in the day. Um, but already people were figuring out while I was writing the best code ever, that the go-to statement was considered harmful. The person that said this was uh, Dutch, just like me. He even came from uh, my hometown, Rotterdam. It was Edgar Dijkstra. And uh, people started introducing structured programming in the early 70s. So we got way more statements like while loops and functions and everything was rainbows and unicorns again until the late 80s when object-oriented programming was introduced. And we got classes and interfaces and inheritance and polymorphism. The most important thing, however, that not that many people talked about at the day was encapsulation, right? With encapsulation, we tried to put things together that had a high cohesion and the things that didn't have high cohesion with each other, we tried to separate those in different classes and so on, so that our code was better maintainable and didn't turn into uh, the spaghetti uh, uh, incident again. 
<coughs> so we had many classes and we forgot to start the timer. I hope I'm just talking for three seconds, so then I have extra time. And we had classes calling classes. The thing is, whenever we thought we would change some class, somewhere else, suddenly something broke. Something that was completely unrelated to the thing we just changed. So we started doing unit tests and I don't know what else. But the sign is that there's still some coupling somewhere, because otherwise the other thing could never break. And we need to fix that coupling. What we got, however, when we thought we were doing object-oriented uh, code, we got procedural code under the guise of OO. So we were still writing spaghetti code with coupling weighing us down and dependencies tripping over each other all the time. So early 90s, we got COM. Uh, Don Box was responsible for that uh, in the Microsoft uh, world. And we just had a little bit bigger components calling each other all the time. And back then we were also introduced into layered architecture. I don't know, uh, probably everyone is uh, somehow familiar with it. Uh, basically all the systems I built looked like something like this. And we had components and classes and everything calling to each other all the way into the back end. The thing was, um, Sometimes we wanted to skip, for example, the service layer. So instead of going directly into the service layer and then the business layer, we would skip the service layer. We could never skip the business layer because that's where our business logic is in, right? And you can't skip business logic. That would be ridiculous. But even, for example, on a website like Amazon, if I would retrieve the name of the user logged in for the first time, I would have to go through the business logic layer which sounded like ridiculous. What I wanted to do was something like this, from the presentation layer directly to the database layer. But yeah, the smart architect told me I couldn't do that. So I asked the smart architect as a young kid, and I didn't find a picture of when I was asking that, so I reused this one. But I asked the architect, like, why are we continuously using those layers? And they come up with a really smart answer, like we have to align uh, the business with our architecture or the other way around, obviously. And they brought in Conway's law. The thing is, I only ended up with these three layers as components in most of my systems. So I, it didn't really make sense. And then finally, in around the year 2000, we were introduced to something uh, called a service-oriented architecture. And I was really stoked about it because that would solve literally all my problems. I didn't experience all the other waves where we got into OO and I don't know what else because that was before I started working professionally. But we got service-oriented oriented architecture and web services and WCF. Who here has experienced WCF? Almost everyone, excellent. Who's still working with WCF? A handful. Yeah, that's because... WCF apparently wasn't the uh, solution to all our problems. But back then we had SOAP and XML and XSD and even WS star specification, which some lovingly called the WS dev star. But uh, remember this was in a time where we just didn't know any better. So if I could go back to the future, back to uh, 1985, I would tell myself to not get an SOA which is a bit weird because SOA in Dutch means STD. But anyway, <laughs> at the same time that we were trying to solve this problem and, uh, of a maintainable software, and we were introduced to service-oriented architecture and web services, there was another type of problem that people were solving. And that was the problem that lots and lots of systems like CRMs and I don't know what else had to talk to each other. And people were building custom solutions for it every single time. And it's the problem of system integration. They, we needed a solution for those systems to more easily or standardized to talk to each other. And that was the rise of the enterprise service bus. Among other, BizTalk Server, IBM WebSphere, and so on. So while they were um, solving this solution, they introduced web services and XML 
so that they all could talk to each other in a standardized way. And the developers that got introduced to service-oriented architecture, they thought, okay, SOA, service, web services, enterprise service bus, there's the word service in literally everything. This can't be a coincidence even though the word service by itself doesn't mean anything. But we thought web services should be something that we should pick up. And that's why we picked up WCF, which was a, a somewhat extended form or a, a nice framework to write web services. And that's how those two got more or more, uh, more or less aligned. Unfortunately, uh, not that many people are doing web services in WCF anymore. So apparently that wasn't the answer. Grady Boots already said it. I don't know if you know him. He's the father of UML, among others. He said, at the time, SOA is the best since punched cards. He might have been a bit sarcastic because he added what a rubbish to it. The thing is, we had these classes and components calling each other, and now we had web services calling each other. So the thing is, we, instead of doing in-process calls, we did out-of-process calls, which are way more expensive, among other because of lots of latency. Right? It took so much longer to execute those calls. Another thing about SOA is apparently reuse, which I've always found very funny, because apparently you could build a web service and then reuse that somewhere else. The only example where I've seen this work is when you requested someone's postal code. Other than that, you couldn't really take a web service that you built in the past and take it to another system and say, okay, now I'm going to use the same one here. There was another thing very important about service-oriented architecture, which I didn't really get at the time. It was about boundaries. You couldn't cross boundaries, but it didn't really occur to me what that meant. But that's what apparently should have brought the encapsulation we were looking for. Anyway, initially we had very small classes. We went bigger, bigger, bigger until web services or services. <coughs> and an example of where I messed up pretty badly when I was introduced to service-oriented architecture. I had to, had to build an application where users could consult and add data. Uh, that's probably every business application. But the thing is, users and data was basically the only thing there. The amount of data, uh, well, the amount of data was pretty large, but it was only, uh, uh, the details were very tiny, slim. So I started thinking about how to build this system. And this is not a young me, but I just like the picture of the guy thinking. And I went to the smart architect again, and we came up with this solution. On the left, users, and on the right, data. And why? Because we were looking at the data, and we couldn't really split it up in any way so that we had two services. So we thought, well, we have users and data. Let's do that. And then we got a requirement saying some users can only see a certain amount of the data. So I went back to the architect and I said, now I have a problem. Because the user interface, right, I, I had some ideas about what architecture was about. The user interface isn't supposed to know where to get the data from. But if I go into the users, then the users can't access the data because then it crosses boundaries. So what should I do? Well, as always, you add a layer because that's the solution, another solution to all your architecture problems. And uh, Geek and Poke already uh, had that figured out as well. Because they, in this picture, they just hide the crap they did the year before with just another layer. It didn't really help me because the developers literally cursed at me to say, how could you come up with such a solution? Anyway, uh, if it hurts, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, that project didn't really go well until in 2010, where we were introduced to microservices. And obviously, we all got very excited about microservices. Because f first of all, no more SOAP, XML, and XSD, XSD, because we now have JSON, right? Because it wasn't our code that wasn't the problem. It's the XML that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> So now we have REST and JSON and Swagger and Swagger Client and GraphQL. And all of this is so much better than the XSD and the XML. And together with Kubernetes and containers, we now have microservices calling microservices. 
Unfortunately, what we're most of us are doing are building a distributed monolith with even more latency. And Simon Brown is another architect, and uh, apparently he is a little bit smarter than the architects I talked about back in the day. But he said, if you can't build a monolith properly, properly then probably you shouldn't try microservices. And um, an example of this is on Stack Overflow, where a question of some person came in, and he said, I built my entire system according to a microservices architecture. And he was crying out for help because he said, if one user executes one action on my website, I end up with 30,000 HTTP requests. Another person said, I don't know that much about microservices, but 30,000 seems a bit too much. I can imagine that it looked like something like this. Does anyone recognize this picture? Because it's being used in presentations around the world before. Do you know which company? Because I see you nodding. But yes, indeed. Netflix talks about this architecture. But I have no idea what this says. I even don't know what they're, how they're communicating between all the blocks, if it's one request going all over the place. But I can imagine that someone sees this and says, oh, if Netflix is successful, I can be successful, implement something like this and end up with 30,000 HTTP requests. Anyway, if Netflix can do it, why can't we? First of all, they have a, more resources than most of us. Um, they're building or they're, they're creating movies that cost way more than uh, most companies have uh, on turnover. Another thing is they have a very different business domain than most of us, right? So I hope you're seeing a pattern here on things we're trying that don't really work. And we need some guidance on how to solve the coupling and whether or not technology is the answer, right? If microservices are the answer. But before I want to get into the answer, I want to debunk some of the myths on microservices. And initially, we talked about they shouldn't have more than 10 lines of code. Well, we dropped that uh, pretty quickly. That's why there it's... Uh, strike through, but the XML versus JSON debate, right? It's no longer a debate these days, but initially people said like XML is so bad, we shouldn't use XML because JSON is so much better readable. The thing is, most of the time I'm not reading JSON or XML, the computer is deserializing it or whatever. The computer is working with it, so I don't think it's a matter that we should be able to read it. Uh, next to the fact that I don't really see a problem with either of them. The only thing is that XML is a little bit more bloated. So if you're very limited on bandwidth and all, then maybe JSON is a better choice. Um, I mean, it's less verbose, it's better readable. But XML also had some great features that when this entire discussion was going on, not a lot of people seem to care about, right? You could verify your XML with XSDs. You could search through your XML with XPath and XQuery. You had XSLT, right? Who didn't in their career ever had lots of XML and had to transform it into HTML. But um, all these features these days are also integrated into uh, JSON. That's why we have these features now. And it's not that it's exactly apples and oranges to compare those because GraphQL is more advanced maybe than what we had back in the day uh, because we do learn for some parts, but I don't really see how JSON is that much better than XML. It doesn't mean I'm saying that JSON is a bad thing, right? So don't worry that Dennis taught you that JSON is bad because I don't think it's bad. It has its place. And I don't see why XML was that much worse. I know that, for example, if you're a front-end developer and you're working in the browser, and you're working with JavaScript or Angular or React, that it's way better to communicate in JSON. 
because when we get data from our database, we map the relational data model to domain objects, and then the domain objects to tra data transfer objects, data transfer objects to the view model, view model to JSON, and then finally no more mapping because we can use JSON in the browser. So go JSON. I'm enthusiastic about JSON. But it doesn't improve my architecture. And that's what initially, when people heard about microservices and JSON, they were so excited because JSON is so much better. Maybe it's better than XML in some ways, but it doesn't improve my architecture. And these are just minor problems um, in our architecture and what microservices brought compared to the bigger problems in microservices. And one of the bigger problems is what this other person experienced on Stack Overflow. And that was due to remote procedure calls, right? Every microservice called into another microservice, having to wait for the answer. So why is it bad to call another service? That's because while we are waiting on the other servers, uh, on the response of that service, our hands are tied. So especially if you have this entire chain that gets into an issue. And uh, I don't know if you know Memphis Depay, he's a Dutch soccer player. He already said it, dependencies are hurting us. But you basically lose autonomy. And why it's bad to call another service? Let's get into an example. Imagine you have to buy some liquor at a store and you have your wallet <coughs> and you want to pay for the liquor. So who decides how you pay for the liquor? Right? Normal people, they would decide, okay, so I have some cash, uh, I have my credit card, I have maybe some coupon, I don't know, and pay with whatever they want. When you start calling other microservices and hand over lots of your data in return or going there, uh, that's probably not the best thing. This guy also did it, he handed over his wallet and uh, he got beaten up and in contact with the police. I don't know if you know Superbad, but uh, it's a funny movie. Anyway, if you hand over your business data, then you no longer have the authority over your own data. And that means that others start making decisions based on what's yours, and that's when you start losing autonomy. That's when there's no proper encapsulation. Because encapsulation means that highly cohesive data should stay within this encapsulated boundary. But if you start sharing it everywhere, that's when those dependencies start hurting. When you change something somewhere, that something else might break. And what if you shared the data with 300 microservices like the Stack Overflow person and the data is uh, incorrect? You don't know who copied your data, who stored it, which services queried your data, and invoices might have been calculated, payments might have been processed, some customer might have gotten preferred status, all based on your data, which you are now no, no, no longer autonomously responsible for. So if everyone can just query your business data via some API or whatever, then at some point in time you'll be looking at your architecture like this and have that maintenance nightmare again. And I'm not saying don't use RPC anywhere, right? I've been talking to people about other forms and then they start doing everything using the other form, which I'll talk about in a bit. But how are we going to query our database without remote procedure calls? And that's just one example, right? I don't want, if you, I want to display the name on the Amazon uh, website that says my username is Dennis or something, I need to query it from somewhere below. So there are definitely options or places to use RPC, but there are also other options. Anyway, things calling things, coupling ev introduced everywhere, and RPC doesn't improve the coupling and cohesion. So don't start calling microservices all over the place. Deployment of microservices is another thing. I read this really funny remark somewhere. Um, that talked about uh, operational agility in repeated deployment and I don't know what else, uh, because that's apparently what microservices improved, um, because probably deploying 300 microservices is easier than deploying one monolith, especially if they also have their own storage technology. 
right? Because you have to update schemas or documents or whatever. And even so, if you have all those microservices, it's just like the classes from back in the day that we can easily take out one and replace it with another one. But even with a small number of lines of code inside one of those microservices, it's still a total rewrite of one of those services, classes or whatever. And you might introduce bugs without knowing it. And it's even harder to test because with OO we had unit tests. Now we need to do integration tests or whatever. And that's because there's coupling everywhere. Now, there are people who obviously love microservices, and that's the operations department, because now they have to deploy, maintain infrastructure, monitor all those microservices, but 300 times over, so they get way better tools, which is nice for them. And even so, again, Docker isn't like a major problem, or Kubernetes, right? Because it's absolutely great for deployment, because Docker isolates, and it scales, and it's multi-cloud. So you can move from AWS to Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. And even if something works on your machine, I don't know if anyone recognizes this sticker, but it was popular a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was a little bit of sarcastic stickers, as in some people thought that if it works on my machine, I just can deploy it and don't worry about it. With Docker, you actually can. Right, so Docker is definitely good and that it improves the encapsulation and isolation, but not of your the data ownership stuff, but of your process. Right? It doesn't improve the coupling at runtime of our architecture. So it doesn't help solve this problem where you might also be struggling with the coupling and all the dependencies you have. And do, spraying some magical Docker dust over your architecture doesn't help. Besides the fact that Docker is an awesome technology, it doesn't improve your architecture. <coughs> so let's talk about what is working and how we can achieve this high cohesion and low coupling. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a golden hammer, right? There's no technology that can just help you. The people that have to solve this or the solution to the problem, I misspoke, are the people in this room or at this conference. And we have to take a few steps back and look at those boundaries that were promised like uh, two decades ago and look at how we can solve the encapsulation. Because a lot of times, when we think we are designing our system and trying to achieve high cohesion and low coupling, it's the opposite, right? What we need to do is instead of having data that's not highly cohesive with each other, put that inside some boundary, but instead we should try to achieve this. This is where we have stuff together within a boundary, and in the, this drawing, they are the clouds, but I steal all my drawings, so I couldn't come up with a better one. Anyway, this is what low coupling and high cohesion looks like, even though there's coupling to in on the right side of the picture, right? Because we can't ever do without any coupling, because that means we have things that don't work together and we don't have a system. So how we can achieve this is by, like I said, taking three steps back and looking at the nouns and the verbs, the things that we learned, maybe at school or university or whatever, and the thing we're looking at, uh, listening to when our business stakeholders are speaking or our product owners or whatever. So we look for nouns like customer and product and order, and those become the entities in our system. And then whenever we're listening to the verbs, like a cost customer orders a product, or an order is shipped to a customer or a customer receives a discount, those verbs are the coupling. And we need to be very careful with those. And we should divide our layers or services or whatever differently. So in the past, we could, for example, have an order service or something. And an order service, each order contains a customer, right? Because a customer does the order. 
Uh, each order contains one or more products. A product has a specific price. Maybe there's a discount on the product or a customer has a discount. And there's possibly a shipping status. Now, all these things, right? If we store the order inside the order service, do they have to be all of them at the same time in the same transaction? Right? Do they share the same high consistency? For example, discount and product info. Let's look at the consistency requirements, where we can form requirements, sometimes in positive requirements, but sometimes also in, I don't know, anti-requirements. For example, if a customer discount is higher than 12%, they can't order purple products. Right? Those things, the discount and the products, were inside the same order. But if we talk to this about uh, to our business domain expert or product owner, they might look at you and it's like, you're probably not completely sane or whatever. But that's when we're on the right path, because we are looking for things that don't share the same consistency with each other. Right? And a good example is discount and product info. They're not related and they don't share those same resistance requirements and don't have to be inside the same transaction. But those are the attributes of the order the way we normally store them. Let's look at another one, price and discount. Another requirement. If a product is on sale, the customer might not get its regular customer discount. Right? That does make sense. So a customer, because they're preferred, they have 10% discount. A product has 25% discount. Should they get another 10% because they're pro preferred customer? Probably not. So they share the same consistency boundary. You need to query that data and update the order and whatever. And that's how we can start looking for those boundaries and see what should be in and what should not be in. So the top one, for example, could be the customer and a first name and a last name. The one on the right could be a catalog item. And I'm just making names up uh, where product name and product description are stored. <laughs> and we even could have a prospect instead of a customer. That doesn't really make uh, a, a difference, right? That's the ubiquitous language if you want to talk about that. And we can name the top one sales and the right one marketing or whatever. It totally depends on your domain and the company you work at. And then we have some other things like customer status and, cu and product discount. Those were supposed to be together. Um, and I didn't give that thing a name yet, because if I give them names, then immediately I assume that other stuff should be in there as well. So you could say it's red or blue or A or B or whatever. And the other one could be, for example, order status and shipping status that belong together. Right? But there's still some coupling, right? In this picture, the yellow lines, there's still some coupling. So if those things can't share data, they need to be, this model needs to be in sync somehow. And we should be looking for the least volatile thing, the thing that changes the least. Does anyone have any idea what that is? Identifiers. Primary keys, whatever you want to call it, right? We're used to that in our database and we can use that as well over here. So here you see the same boxes, except the top left one has customer ID, the top right one catalog item ID, and the other one that's dealing with customer status and discount is based on those identifiers, but it has no idea about the attributes in the other services. And this changes how we design and model our system, because we need to find those attributes, and that also takes time, because while the this, the developers, they always want to immediately start developing using the latest technologies, but the architect is taking a decision, so the developer can't start yet. Because we need to figure out in what direction we want to go. Because if we go into a, the wrong direction for too long, it's very hard to turn around 180 degrees. So it's no time yet to start playing with all the tools and, and uh, frameworks and I don't know what else, so that we don't get the spaghetti code, right? But once we find these highly cohesive 
things inside one of those consistency boundaries will notice that they don't have to talk to each other again. Right? We end up with logical services that communicate less because why would code that's dealing with prices and discounts need to talk to a service or a thing that has the customer's phone number? Or if we're dealing with delivery of food or whatever, why would details on the delivery would need to talk to something that's dealing with the price of a product? It doesn't, right? It shouldn't cross those boundaries. So if we take a look at our monolith, this is our monolith, and we had these three layers. We always basically have those three layers. The user interface doesn't have to be HTML or whatever, or a mobile app it can also be an API. And in the past, every layer was responsible for all the entities and all the attributes of each entity. But if we start separating those out, we start ending up with these vertical slices or whatever you want to call them. And if we look at each of these vertical slices, we end up with each of these layers inside one of those vertical slices. So it's responsible for everything from the data in the database up until the user interface. So it contains microservices, microviews, etc., etc. It's responsible for everything from data to user interface. How do we present that in the user interface again? Via a composite UI. So if you have a UI, it's made up of many small parts. Some of it can come from the sales service, others come from the customer service, finance, shopping, and this is how we make up a user interface. So if we take Amazon again as an example, and I simplified it here a bit. For example, the title of a book and the image of a book could come from a product catalog service and other details from other services. And that's how we compose the user interface. But even those microservices, they don't have to talk to each other and share data, right? One more thing, we had uh, functions, classes, components, and we grew larger and larger, and then back to the right to microservices again. And these days, it's funny that we have Azure functions and AWS lambdas. So we started with functions and we're back with functions. I'm curious what the next thing will be. The problem that we see repeating is the calling part, right? All those microservices shouldn't call each other. And um, some other guy already mentioned it with a name that's hard to pronounce, so I won't try it. He said, we need inversion of communication by supplementing service-oriented architecture with an event-driven architecture. So if we do that, because services can't call each other, and they still have to be in sync, we can do that with publish subscribe without sharing business data so that we don't cross the service boundary, right? However, our events are very small. So there's never an order shipping address that I'm publishing. Instead, I'm publishing order accepted with just an order ID. So if I publish order accepted, the other thing might think, hey, it's accepted, now I know how to invoice it. I don't know the name of the product, I don't know if it's in stock, but I do know the price and a possible discount. So I can invoice, and all based on just a single identifier. Right? Because why would we communicate the address if no one's going to use it? And why communicate price and discount to something that is aware of the phone number? It doesn't. We need services that are the technical authority for a specific business capability. Another example with another service, it could also receive order accepted, but also order paid. And then once it knows order paid, it knows it can ship the order. Again, it doesn't know the name of the product, also doesn't know the pr price, but it does know the weight and the size of how to ship it inside containers. So we always end up with containers again. Right? And I do know the shipping address because I'm the technical authority for this business capability. And I said it before, one more thing, time is running out, so I need to be fast as well. If I publish customer became preferred with an identifier from invoicing to shipping, right? shipping doesn't really know who made the customer preferred, and more importantly, it doesn't know why the customer became preferred. But I do know that I need to ship faster, for example, or provide different packaging options or whatever. Again, because it's the technical authority. 
And this way, business data is not shared and autonomy is guaranteed. And you don't have to share data like uh, McLovin did. <coughs> So we need to focus on those boundaries and then we end up with right-sized services, right? They don't really end up in Visual Studio or JetBrains Rider because they contain many aspects of one of those vertical slices. So if we look at them, right, inside of them, we process events and can immediately publish events. We could have microservices in one of them. We could have DDD in another one. <laughs> CQRS in another one, but there's no one size fits all. There's no technology that can really help you figure this out. It can help you build the system, but it doesn't help your architecture. So if you want to start prevent uh, the spaghetti code, and I'll skip these, look at asynchronous messaging. And if you start small, you'll have a system Initially, that's customer uh, objects, products, etc., and it, you add features to it, and it grows larger and larger and larger, and you end up with this monolithic nightmare, right? Start publishing events at the border of the system so that you can create a component that works on its own, that's separate. And you can say, okay, this is service A or logical service A, somewhere else there's logical service B, and you end up with more and more of these things where you extract functionality, uh, all have their own database, and I couldn't draw a better picture, but this is a smiley. You'll have a happy system with clear boundaries, right? You shouldn't roll your own framework because uh, when you start using messaging, because uh, you can, there are random frameworks available, and this is just one of the random frameworks. If you still want to build one of your own, watch this video. I'll give you the link later. In summary, and I'm ending it really fast now, microservices is an attempt to uh, reclaim the core meaning of SOA, and we should look at those boundaries and use public, publish, subscribe, and an event-driven architecture to achieve autonomous microservices, or not microservices, but logical service. I'm skipping this as well. So we end up with high cohesion and low coupling, and I think microservices is SOA done right. Thanks for watching my presentation. If you want to know more, I did a presentation on eventual consistency where I go into this messaging and how you end up with eventual consistency and how that can pose a problem with how to deal with it. I have a presentation later where I go into more of this composite UI thing here at Ordev at three o'clock. My name again is Dennis van der Stel. Thanks for seeing me go through lots and lots of slides. And if you want more information, contact me here at the venue or scan the link or the URL and that's it. Thank you for your attention.